Terminator Genesis was very challenging from a visual effects point of view. One of the things that, as a huge fan of Terminator, and one of the things we knew that the fans really wanted, I mean, if you read any online commentary, is that people want to see the fully rendered Future War. And so, obviously, our movie opens up on the day that the John Connor leads humanity, basically, to success against the machines. And it is the biggest Future War sequence that has been in a Terminator movie to date. The Future War, the War Camp War, was, um, for most parts, really sort of uh, initiated with like a lot of concept work. We received, basically, these sort of plates from the principal photography. And it sort of, you know, came with the premises of extending it and making it sort of this post-apocalyptic environment. And the more we got involved in the sequence and the more we started working on it, the more it became clear that the premises was like, you know, the more the better, where, you know, almost nothing could fit into the image anymore, you know? So it was about like making it as epic and as big as humanly possible. <laughs> the HKs and the T-800s are obviously canon from the, from the first two movies. They were kind of updated and redesigned by our incredible visual effects team, which is really led by, you know, Yannick Sers and Sherry Hansen. There were the spider tanks, which were a new design, obviously, that Jim had actually developed uh, very, very early on, but they were never actually able to bring them to fruition. It was really fun getting to actually sit, you know, obviously in post for many, many months with the, with the VFX many, team, many uh, months. obviously helping to develop and, and, and create these shots. Yannick Sears, he's our visual effects supervisor, and he's probably got more experience at these movies than any of us, so we're all a little bit intimidated by him. He sort of keeps us on our toes frequently. He pushes back when we suggest things, and um, he's found solutions for things that we didn't find. And just the, the bar he sets for the finished visual effects is very, very high. What excited me about this Terminator movie was probably the prospect of the recreation of the young Arnold character. You know, Yannick Sers, who was our visual effects supervisor, and Sherry Hansen, who's our visual effects producer, probably the first thing they ever said to us after they read the script was, um, the John Connor design is going to be challenging, but the young Arnold in Griffith Park, you're not gonna get that until you rip it out of our hands the very last minute when this movie is locked. It is already difficult enough, I guess, to create a human being digitally. It becomes even more difficult if that human being is like such an iconic figure as Arnold Schwarzenegger. Right from the start, we couldn't leave any stone unturned. So our whole process, how we did digital characters in the past, had to be evaluated and changed or invent new technologies wherever possible to just raise the bar. The observatory sequence of the Griffith Park um, sequence that we worked on sort of you know splits almost into two two portions into two halves like the first portion being basically the recreation of the original movie scenes you know of the arrival from the young Arnold and we're basically introducing that young Arnold character traveling back in time then the second half and the second part is basically where the storyline deviates a little bit and that's when young Arnold is basically finding himself like you know being exposed or to an opponent which is basically himself just at an older older age and that's um, from there and effectively where we have this sort of face-off between young versus old. I've been waiting for you. First, we built the set in New Orleans and shot it practically. Arnold obviously plays the Guardian, but there's the entire process of, of youthifying, obviously, Guardian to turn our 67-year-old Arnold Schwarzenegger into a 50-year-old version of himself. Then we actually scoured the Earth to find basically a bodybuilder uh, by the name of Brett who basically is the only human being on the planet who is almost as big as Arnold was when he was Mr. Universe. It was all sort of choreographed with the stunt double, you sort of acted that out. But what happened throughout the process is we basically had to discard the plate almost entirely. We almost had to say, like, okay, you know, the lens isn't quite right to be, you know, correct enough and close enough to the original footage, and the framing isn't quite right. So we decided basically to go almost full CG. The first process is you build the model, which gets you very, very close to where you want to be. But then at the end of it, you get into this uncanny area when you're looking at it to where you're 5% off, things will look right, but it's that glint behind the eyes, it's the way the light interacts with your skin, all of this incredibly finite detail that separates from something that feels actually alive and living and something that just feels dead. Well, the sculpt of his cheekbones feel a little bit better. He still, his face feels just a little bit wider. And I think if we take that down, and so we really feel like, I think it'll accentuate the cheek line more, make the, uh, the jawline more defined, which is so Arnold. The review process with um, 
uh, our clients um, started off, you know, at the beginning mostly with um, us working together with Yannick, basically, and we sort of had regular review sessions with him twice or three times a week where we went through the processes and the steps. With a character like the young Arnold, it was something that, you know, took pretty much, you know, our entire time from the start of the show when we first started working on this project all the way to the end where we literally continuously built and refined this young Arnold character. Then further down the line, when it came more to the shot production, we started, you know, being more and more exposed to the filmmakers like Ellen Taylor on David Ellison and, and Dana Goldberg. It was a highly creative process, but also a very time-consuming process for us to, you know, study and research like what Arnold, um, yeah, it was like back then, effectively. <laughs> nice night for a walk. Wash day tomorrow. Nothing clean, right? Nothing clean, right. You know, Terminator movies have a history of phenomenal practical effects and groundbreaking visual effects. Cameron, when he makes movies, always um, pushes the envelope on what's possible. And on T2, he did it in a big way that really um, had a sort of pride of place in the movie. The T1000 technology seemed impossible at the time. I remember seeing it, and I think we all, you know, thought, how do you do that? Well, Terminator 2 was made at the really the dawn of the CG character age. We made a whole movie in 1990, it was released in the summer of 91, that had a fluid metallic character as the bad guy. So we were betting the farm on this new technique and it kind of just blew up. Two and a half decades later, it's an extremely mature art form. Well, the C-1000, what we wanted to explore about how we could take it any further with the breaking down and the transformation of the form. We did a whole bunch of different fancy fluid sims and all the rest of it, but they actually, if anything, the more complex we got, the more the further away we got from the original uh, material. Weirdly enough, we went completely full circle back to almost doing it in a similar fashion to how they did it on T2 to actually obtain that similar sort of look. So, for example, the, the shot where he comes through the window in the police car is all just a series of sculpts. Equally, when he melts in the acid bath, that is all pure fluid sim. We had some fantastic performance um, from Bayung and uh, for the T1000, and we really wanted to get the essence of his acting across, even though parts of him were going to be fully CG. To tackle that, we really developed a pipeline that allowed us to work iteratively in effects very quickly to dial in more of his performance or dial it more towards effects for dramatic effect, specifically in the acid bath sequence of him being eroded away. It's very hard to surprise people. So, you know, the challenge on this film was, yes, we're gonna see Terminator endoskeletons, and we're gonna see a lot of, of other CG effects that you might not think too much about. But in the center of it all is this new bad guy. And he can't just be the same simple liquid metal dude that we saw, you know, a couple decades ago. So they've gone to a much higher level. I think we kept pushing ourselves to try and find a vocabulary for that villain and the imagery that would be almost as challenging. Cameron's T-1000 was a beautiful, creature that was absolutely simple and we have a beautiful creature that is absolutely complex and so we're sort of embracing complexity in, in our T3000. Dineg did an unbelievable job on this movie and really delivered in every single way with the design of John Connor who is a um, man-machine hybrid whose body has actually been infected on a cellular level. You know you have to think about the, the lineage behind it all. You know, from the T-800, the T-1000, what would be the next design, being as it's Skynet that's designed this thing. So he is, at the start, they're just replicating him. So it's a nanosite humanoid thing. That hurt. When we start to develop this from last year, from basically from how he looks like, from the concept to modeling, the shader, it, we went through a lot of development until roughly last December, it's kind of confirmed. The fact that Cyberdyne had come up with a way of replacing and improving on the human body with these intelligent particles, who was never in a stable state, who was constantly being reinvented. And the analogy we came up with was as if he was being 3D printed. My mission was to literally build this like superhuman, but with all this design in it. We started like some kind of two branch of it, like one be like fully nanotech kind of organic fields, and one will be like more close to T800 Skynet fields. 
Ultimately, this would be like the containers and the guides for all the nano machine effects, which would be on top of this. Our job kind of started once the design was sort of settled. So our job was to actually make him look like he's made out of a million little nanobots or something, some sort of nanotech that's kind of making up the whole idea of John Connor. Traditional animation, you would just animate each point, but it gets really tricky for like a million nanopoints. So we came up with algorithms and we invented all those really advanced techniques, but uh, once it was all set up, it was the machine doing the work for us. Because you're never gonna get away with like animating millions of points for like a thousand shots. Crack it! They can't kill John Connor, you know? So then they need to control John Connor. So the T2000 in that sense is not a, you know, it's not a straight robot. It is, it is, uh, it is partly John. It's very important to us that you saw that Jason, or Jason's features, his performance was still there. What we thought was cool with this is he controls his own magnetic fields, right? That's how he's, his form is actually generated. The reason that we have the MRI scene is to actually see that, that he is susceptible to something. So yes, he's slowly being pulled apart in layers on that particular shot. And you can see the various different organs in there. So that's obviously after that, he's designed a little bit more all the way through the film to the point where you see him in the, in the fight at the end. He's a much more streamlined and ripped version of that. There's um, that technique, it's called phasing. It's when the T-3000 goes through the Terminator and shreds his cloth and all his skin. Obviously that's something we've never seen before and it's really hard to imagine because it's such an advanced and it's really complicated and complex to describe. Obviously we need to show like different versions and different ideas and go through like a lot of iterations. The phasing was one kind of uh, um, trademark moment within that sequence where he's supposed to kind of separate and then reform around Guardian, go through him, uh, create a lot of damage. And basically Jason Clarke turns into his T-3000 form. Obviously, you need to get the animation right. It needs to look like two guys are actually fighting. So we had like this really advanced motion capture technology, which kind of fed into the animation, which then fed into the nanification process. And that bring all that pretty much from CG onto the screen to like a photoreal composite. That was really, that was a tough challenge. That is one of the last shots that they finished on the movie. And in that shot, John Connor, T-1000 is entirely CG. Arnold Schwarzenegger and Guardian is entirely CG, and the environment that they take place in is 90% CG. And literally, it looks photorealistic and perfect, and the work they have done on this movie is truly, truly groundbreaking. What are you? I'm Skynet. The T-5000 was, uh, it, it went through a few looks uh, before we finally settled on, on what you will see in the finished film. But I guess the general concept behind it was, it was a projection but it was obviously a projection that eventually grew and became a physical object. So in, in this case, it's, uh, we went by the whole belief that this laser would ionize the air and actually create particles from elements that were already there, but they were just almost solidifying them. So as he grew, uh, he became more and more of a physical creature. So it starts as a child, it grows all the way through to be Matt Smith and the T-5000. So this, we wanted that as some kind of design ethic to show evolution, complexity, and rapid growth. There was a lot of ideas about what the T-5000 should be. I mean, what is pure Skynet? Phosphorescence is really the element that we looked at because we wanted kind of the air particles to ionize on and not the hologram you've seen a thousand times, but for it to be something different with technology you hadn't seen before. You know, if you go night diving, you shut off all your lights and you wave your hand underwater, you'll get these kind of green phosphorescence that will glow and kind of ionize on, ionize off. And that was really the concept behind how to create really the T-5000 in Matt Smith. In addition to sort of all of the beauty aspects of what they were creating, they also then had to really fit into a very logical box. How much of the face do we want to see? How much of the body do we really want to see? We needed him to be immediately recognizable. When, when Jai looks at him and says, that's the thing that attacked John. That's the thing that attacked John. I didn't attack John. I saved him. We needed to really understand that he had the ability to do that. The feedback that I've been given or that I've received so far from the filmmakers or from Yannick or Sherry, it's been positive. And I think everyone on the, on the production side was very happy and I, I hope that they all were very pleased with, with the results. Hopefully the guys, the audience, look at the T-1000, the T-3000 and, and still see that it harks back to the original material, you know, albeit with a slightly different twist. You know, it's a lot of work. A huge amount of people have done have worked a lot of time on this and hopefully it shows. Yay! All right, that's all folks. Thank you very much. Thank for you. Time.